Welcome to Dialogue. Today I'm joined by Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. We'll be talking about a whole range of issues concerning Russia, including the security threat to its Central Asian allies brought by the instability in Afghanistan. Of course, we'll also talk about COVID and Western sanctions over a major Russia-led natural gas pipeline. How will Russia confront its many challenges at home and abroad? That's our topic. I'm Wang Guan. Director Kortunov, let's talk about the situation in Afghanistan. It has been a volatile. Uh, the suicide bombing in the Kabul airport obviously has not uh, made things any better. Uh, what will happen next? I mean, what will the situation uh, over there in Afghanistan evolve? Well, it's clear that uh, Taliban uh, is interested in uh, stabilizing the situation. They want to act as a responsible power. Uh, but uh, the position that uh, they used to have, the position of a major opposition group, uh, is now vacant. So we see uh, other radical Islamist organizations trying to fill the vacuum. And uh, I think that that explains the explosion in the Kabul airport. Uh, allegedly, uh, ISIS uh, is trying to position itself uh, as the major opposition movement. Uh, uh, and uh, if uh, uh, for some reasons, the popularity of Taliban goes down, uh, for example, because of the deterioration of the economic situation, uh, then ISIS uh, can come up as its uh, major rival. Maybe not ISIS, maybe Al-Qaeda. Of course, we know that uh, many radicals in Afghanistan are shifting uh, uh, institutional affiliations quite easily. So unfortunately, I think that it will be a bumpy road for everybody. A lot uh, will depend uh, on how smart and how wise uh, Taliban will turn out to be. A lot will depend on external powers, uh, but uh, it will be a bumpy road ahead for sure. Okay, let's talk about Russia's role in all this. Moscow has been slowly building relations with the Taliban, uh, whose representatives have been coming to Moscow for talks since 2018. And taking into account the long and complicated history between Russia and the Taliban, how would you characterize this relationship? Well, it's too early to make any final conclusions, but I think that in Moscow they are ready to give uh, Taliban the benefit of the doubt. Uh, of course, uh, it's a new generation of Taliban leaders. You cannot compare them with uh, those who uh, ran the, the show in the uh, 1990s. Uh, not to mention the days of the uh, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, uh, but it's not yet clear uh, what uh, these folks are up to. And uh, Taliban uh, is not monolithic. Uh, there are many trends within Taliban. But in the end of the day, uh, the Russian goals in Afghanistan are pretty limited. Uh, Russia doesn't want, uh, Talib doesn't want Afghanistan to turn uh, in, in, into a place for which uh, they can uh, plan and exercise uh, terrorist acts uh, in uh, Central Asia and in Russia proper. Uh, and also, uh, Russia would like uh, to limit, uh, to the extent possible, the uh, flow of drugs uh, from Taliban uh, to Russia and further to Europe. If uh, Taliban uh, can deliver uh, these uh, 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 two uh, goals to Russia, I think uh, in Moscow they will be happy. Uh, they do not care that much about uh, domestic developments uh, in Afghanistan. It's not up to Russia uh, to judge uh, about what is the best uh, for the Afghan people. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, in the Russian society, they still have the uh, Afghan trauma. Uh, so uh, I don't think that any politician uh, in my country uh, uh, would be ready to say that Russia, under a certain set of circumstances, uh, should uh, intervene uh, into Afghanistan militarily. I think that uh, it's not likely to happen, uh, and uh, uh, Russia, uh, Russia's involvement uh, with uh, Afghanistan will remain quite limited. Okay, let's talk about Russia's stance specifically towards uh, the Taliban. It has been a very interesting one. Uh, on August 16th, Russia said its diplomatic mission in Kabul would remain open 
and its ambassador to Afghanistan praised, actually, the Taliban's conduct over its takeover. But a week later, uh, four Russian military planes evacuated Russian and other nationals from Kabul. And later on, Russia's Federal Service of Military and Technical Cooperation Director said Russia does not recognize the Taliban movement and will, quote-unquote, never have any military ties with the group. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, well, uh, 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 first of all, uh, indeed, you know, uh, leaders of Taliban uh, came to Moscow uh, just uh, on the eve of the takeover, uh, and they uh, made certain commitments. Uh, they promised uh, uh, Russia that uh, Taliban uh, will not engage and uh, will not uh, allow anyone else uh, to engage into terrorist uh, activities on the territory of the uh, Central Asian countries or in Russia. Uh, and uh, one should probably also note that Russia's relations uh, to the previous regime in Afghanistan, to the leadership of uh, President Ghani, uh, were quite complicated. Uh, uh, so uh, in, in certain ways, uh, uh, Russia will not miss uh, the, uh, the previous administration uh, in Kabul. However, having said that, I should also note that, uh, of course, Russia is concerned. Russia is concerned because uh, we don't know to what extent Taliban can control the situation in Afghanistan uh, and uh, to what extent uh, the Russian citizens and citizens uh, of uh, other countries can feel safe in Afghanistan. Uh, therefore, this evacuation is probably appropriate uh, we don't know, for example, uh, if uh, Taliban is committed uh, to fighting against uh, uh, ISIS uh, or Al-Qaeda on its territory. I wouldn't rule out uh, some kind of support that uh, Moscow can render uh, for, to Taliban in order to continue this fight. So I don't uh, imagine a direct military a cooperation between Taliban and uh, Moscow. I don't think that Taliban really needs uh, this cooperation at this juncture. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, 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 under certain circumstances, uh, we can uh, count uh, on a constructive partnership, which will include uh, some kind of security dimension. But do you think Moscow will recognize the Taliban regime, Taliban government, whatever you call it, uh, officially recognize their government? And do you think Moscow will look at the United States and the Western societies um, and to see if they will recognize the Taliban government first? Well, as you know, Taliban uh, is uh, blacklisted uh, in Russia as a terrorist organization. Uh, I don't think that uh, we will see a delisting uh, in the immediate future. I think that uh, uh, Russia is likely to keep uh, Taliban uh, in a limbo, uh, which uh, does not prevent uh, uh, various contacts uh, between Russia and Taliban. I can give you an example. Uh, after the Arab Spring uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, when the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, came to power in Cairo. Uh, Muslim Brother Brotherhood uh, was also uh, on the list uh, of terrorist organizations in Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it has not been delisted, which uh, did not, uh, however, prevent uh, President Mursi to come to Moscow and to have negotiations with Russian leaders. So I think that uh, Russia will not uh, uh, really uh, uh, try to delist uh, uh, Taliban in the immediate future, but it will uh, definitely keep uh, contacts with Taliban uh, and uh, uh, it will uh, keep its embassy in uh, uh, Kabul. Uh, in terms of recognition, uh, I think it's an open question because uh, today there are many ideas that probably the international community should uh, come up with some sort of uh, a collective recognition that instead of uh, making individual decisions, uh, major international players uh, should uh, get together uh, and uh, agree uh, on the preconditions uh, on which uh, they can recognize uh, Taliban as a legitimate uh, 
uh, government in Kabul. And uh, probably in this case, uh, the international community will have uh, stronger negotiating positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Taliban. And of course, uh, Taliban needs this recognition uh, at least uh, uh, to uh, see uh, resume the flows of international assistance uh, to Taliban, because uh, to, not to Taliban, but rather to Afghanistan, uh, because uh, the country uh, still uh, lives uh, to a large extent on a life support system. Uh, it uh, uh, cannot uh, balance uh, its mm -hmm. trade uh, budget and basically, you know, it right. depends on international assistance to, to a very large extent. Right. Many people, including some Russian diplomats and politicians, consider the withdrawal of U.S. troops and the power shift to the Taliban as a victory for Russia as he approves the failure of the United States and its policy towards Afghanistan. Do you share that viewpoint and that sentiment? Well, there is a sentiment here uh, and uh, also a kind of uh, feeling of uh, revenge because, of course, uh, in the uh, 1980s, the United States uh, actually created Taliban to fight the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, now this Frankenstein <laughs> got loose uh, and the United States itself uh, uh, has uh, experienced a humiliating defeat uh, together with its uh, allies uh, in Afghanistan. However, uh, I think that uh, we should not forget uh, that uh, when the United States and its partners uh, invaded Afghanistan some 20 years e uh, earlier, uh, 20 years ago, uh, this uh, move by the United States uh, got an approval uh, from the United Nations Security Council uh, and uh, Russia, as well as China and uh, other members, permanent members of the Security uh, Council, did not oppose this move. Uh, moreover, uh, if you uh, look back at early stages of the uh, U.S. Uh, operation in Afghanistan, Russia rendered a lot of assistance uh, in terms of uh, 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 the northern uh, transportation uh, corridor, and uh, it didn't oppose the United States uh, uh, acquiring permanent military presence uh, in the Central Asian region. Uh, so, uh, you know, we should not forget that uh, this was a legitimate international operation, not just a uh, an operation like, for example, the U.S. invasion in uh, Iraq in 2003, where the United States uh, bypassed, bypassed the United Nations and even the NATO alliance. However, uh, I think that uh, it is clear now that the United States uh, uh, can no longer uh, get successfully involved uh, into state building in remote places uh, of the world. So the question is uh, whether neighboring countries uh, like uh, Central Asian states and China and Pakistan and Iran and Russia can uh, fix the problem better than the United States and uh, its uh, partners in the international coalition tried to do. And it will be very difficult. Of course, uh, Afghanistan is a hard nut to crack. Indeed, uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin and Ch Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke over the phone recently, uh, once again emphasizing the need and uh, the importance of establishing peace in Afghanistan and, you know, prevent the spread of instability to the neighboring countries. You know, China shares the border with Afghanistan. Uh, Russia, you know, shares the border with uh, many of the Central Asian countries, which shares the border with Afghanistan. Um, how do you think China and Russia should coordinate their policies uh, regarding Afghanistan uh, at this point? Well, uh, definitely uh, China is a very important player uh, in Afghanistan. Arguably, uh, it is uh, the most important economic actor uh, in the region. Although uh, its uh, border with Afghanistan is pretty short uh, and uh, it is well protected, uh, but uh, definitely China should also be concerned about potential infiltration of uh, radical groups, maybe not directly uh, through the uh, China-Afghanistan border, but at least uh, through the uh, borders of Central Asian states. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, that uh, might uh, complicate the situation in the west of China and uh, clear, uh, you know, these uh, radical elements uh, might uh, try to uh, inspire uh, some uh, 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 radical groups, uh, primarily within the Uyghur population of China. Uh, so uh, China should be concerned, uh, Russia is definitely concerned, and uh, China and Russia have uh, a lot of opportunities for cooperation, uh, primarily uh, cooperation uh, in uh, intelligence sharing, uh, cooperation uh, in uh, 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 maybe uh, more uh, military exercises. Uh, I think that uh, Russia and China might also cooperate uh, in certain development projects uh, in uh, infrastructure, transportation, and energy in Afghanistan. Some of this cooperation might uh, uh, be bilateral. Uh, some of this cooperation uh, might uh, be pursued uh, through multilateral institutions like the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and uh, maybe others. Uh, so I can imagine that right now we have uh, very intense consultations with our partners in Beijing about uh, what uh, we should and what we should not do regarding Afghanistan. And I'm sure that uh, these consultations are complemented uh, by talks with other regional players, uh, because Pakistan will be very important uh, given its long-standing relations uh, with the uh, Taliban. But we uh, should not forget about Iranians who have their own interests uh, in uh, 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 in Afghanistan, and also, of course, Central Asian states uh, have uh, right. uh, uh, their own concerns and uh, their uh, their own interests as well. Talking about China's relations with Russia, um, of course, one other important player is the United States, uh, which has been going around the world telling its Western allies and its partners in Asia how dangerous China has become. You know, portraying China as this aggressive power. Uh, and some even say that uh, Washington is trying to drive a wedge between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, does Russia fear China's rise as an economic power? <laughs> I think that uh, here in Russia we might envy uh, the Chinese rise uh, because uh, indeed it, it, it is spectacular and uh, uh, it's a remarkable phenomenon uh, that uh, I think uh, all the world observes uh, uh, with admiration. Uh, however, I don't think that uh, there is any particular fear, at least for the time being, because uh, uh, the Russian-Chinese relations are stable. Uh, uh, these are relations of equal partners. I don't think that uh, China tries to impose its will on Moscow. At least uh, I don't see it happening. Uh, but I think that all of us, including Russia, have a lot uh, to learn from China. Uh, in terms of its economic growth uh, uh, and uh, maybe also in terms of how China uh, handles its uh, social problems. Uh, I would like to specifically uh, underscore uh, the success story uh, in dealing with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, arguably, China uh, handled uh, this problem much better than any other major power in the world. And of course, uh, that suggests that we should look uh, into the China's experience and hopefully we will learn something from this experience. All right. We've been talking to Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. We will take a short break. Stay with us. <music> Director Kortunov, let's continue our discussion. Um, German's Chancellor Angela Merkel met with Russian President Putin for a three-hour meeting. After her visit to Moscow, she visited Ukraine, uh, Kiev uh, to be particular. And during a joint press conference, uh, Zelensky said this about uh, Russia-led uh, gas pipeline Nord Stream 2. Zelensky said it is a, you know, a geopolitical weapon of Kremlin. Uh, Merkel said that... Um, Berlin agree with Washington in that Nord Stream 2 should not be used against Ukraine. Uh, how delicate a balance is it for Germany uh, when Berlin considers this natural gas pipeline? 
I think it's it's, it's a difficult uh, balancing act for Germans because, of course, uh, they would love to restore the transatlantic partnership with the United States, uh, and uh, they would like uh, to keep uh, the U.S. position in mind. Uh, at the same time, uh, Nord Stream 2 is uh, really important economically for Germany. Uh, it's uh, a major source of uh, cheap energy, which uh, Germany needs right now. But uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, Angela Merkel, when she was in Kiev, she also argued that uh, given the Green Deal of the European Union, uh, uh, at some point, uh, maybe not in the immediate future, but at some point, uh, this whole transit uh, uh, will become irrelevant. Uh, so Ukraine should look for other opportunities uh, uh, in terms of its cooperation uh, with Europe. Uh, maybe uh, Ukraine should uh, also invest much more uh, in the green economy than it does right now. Uh, and uh, uh, the time will come uh, when uh, uh, Europe will not need the Russian gas. And uh, we should all start getting ready uh, for this future, even if uh, this future will not uh, come tomorrow. All right, let's talk about Russia's economy. Uh, Russia's economic figures show that its economy expanded at its fastest pace in 20 years. But at the same time, inflation reached 6.68%. That is a five-year high. What is the true state of Russia economy, uh, you know, according to your vantage point? My take generally is that uh, uh, the, the good news about the Russian economy is that uh, it's, uh, 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 it is very resilient. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we can talk about inflation, but I think that uh, inflation is more or less under control. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, balance, uh, the balance of the budget is under control. I don't see any immediate uh, major risks uh, for the Russian economy. But uh, the bad news is that uh, we still need uh, major structural reforms. And uh, without such reforms, it would be very difficult to accelerate the economic growth. So the economy uh, is resilient, uh, but uh, it is slow. And that uh, constitutes uh, certain limitations on what Russia can do both domestically and internationally. President Putin set a goal back in 2018, that is Russia should become the world's fifth largest economy in 2024. Do you think Russia is on track to achieve that goal? Well, it partly depends on how you count, uh, because uh, statistics uh, might be misleading. Uh, if you take uh, the uh, purchasing power parity, maybe yeah. indeed uh, Russia uh, is higher than Germany even today. At least some experts believe that uh, the decline in Germany was uh, deeper than in Russia, and probably Russia surpassed Germany in terms of uh, its economic performance. Uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, I think that if the goal is uh, to really accelerate the growth, uh, a lot uh, has uh, to be done uh, in, in terms of uh, promoting uh, small and uh, medium-sized businesses, uh, in terms of uh, uh, easing the uh, bureaucratic load of the economy, uh, in terms of unleashing uh, the human capital. Uh, there are many things that uh, have to be done. Uh, some of them are being done. Some of them are put on the shelf. Uh, so it's a very mixed picture, uh, but definitely economic challenge uh, is one of the main challenges that the country confronts. All right, let's talk about COVID uh, that is still rampant in much of the world, uh, particularly its uh, Delta variant. And more than half a year has passed since COVID-19 vaccines have been distributed. But uh, according to a data, uh, a dozen richer countries of the world possess the, the bulk of the global vaccine supplies. Um, as Russia's leading geopolitical analyst and scholar, how upset are you about the lack of international cooperation when it comes to COVID prevention and vaccine distribution? 
Well, personally, uh, I'm quite frustrated because I hoped uh, maybe in a rather naive way that uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, would uh, trigger uh, much more international cooperation, that uh, it is a signal that you know, we have to get together, we should put aside our differences, uh, no matter how important these differences are, uh, and uh, she, we should uh, join uh, uh, other nations uh, in uh, fighting uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, we should enhance uh, uh, WHO and other international institutions. Uh, we should take a consulted action uh, in uh, providing vaccines to poorer nations of the world. Uh, however, I was disappointed because not much of uh, this uh, has happened so far. And uh, instead of cooperation, we have uh, a vaccine race. Uh, we have a competition, uh, I would say, a competition accompanied by an information war. Our nations uh, try to discredit the vaccines of each other. And of course, uh, uh, poor countries uh, uh, in the global south uh, are, are left uh, uh, without due assistance. So I'm very uh, frustrated. I think uh, we can still uh, uh, change gears uh, and start working uh, with each other in a much more uh, substantive uh, and productive way. But unfortunately, so far, I do not see any particular appetite uh, for working together. Uh, especially any appetite uh, from our Western partners. So maybe it will change, but so far uh, it is not changing, unfortunately. Uh, and finally, on uh, COVID origin tracing, uh, 90 days has passed since Joe Biden ordered its intelligence community to present him a comprehensive report on the origin of COVID. What do you th make of the U.S. intelligence community's report? Well, uh, Bill Burns, uh, who now leads uh, CIA, uh, has stated that uh, the odds are that probably we will never know for sure. Uh, we will do our best, he argued, but uh, uh, it's not clear whether it is possible uh, to get uh, to the uh, real origins of, uh, of COVID. Uh, allegedly, they appropriated some huge database uh, from the uh, laboratory in Wuhan, but uh, again, it's not clear whether that database can help them to investigate the case. It's a little bit strange for me that uh, this mission was uh, uh, delegated to the U.S. intelligence. It, in my view, it would be more logical to engage uh, uh, the international uh, research community and uh, institutions like uh, WHO. Uh, but the problem that I see with this investigation is that, uh, at least in the U.S. media, uh, it is uh, used uh, uh, to uh, somehow feed uh, uh, anti-Chinese uh, sentiments uh, and uh, anti-Chinese passions in the U.S. society. Uh, China is uh, depicted as a global villain, even uh, though uh, the United States uh, has no compelling evidence against China. It is unfortunate, and I think that reflects the overall situation that we see uh, in the international system today. There is a growing bipolarity in the world, uh, China versus the United States, uh, and uh, it seems that the Biden administration is trying to distract uh, the public attention uh, in the United States uh, from uh, investigating the reasons uh, for a spectacular failure of uh, this country to cope uh, with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, even today, uh, the pandemic yeah. uh, is uh, very, 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 bro very broadly spread in the United States, uh, and that constitutes a real problem. Mr. Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to picking your brain you. again soon. Thank you very much. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Thank you for watching.